welcome to Navajo County Connection. I'm Donna Faye Whitesinger, District 5 Navajo County Supervisor, and today I have two special guests with me to recognize October as Domestic Violence Month. And I'll give them the opportunity to introduce themselves, and we'll start with Roxanne. Good morning, Roxanne. Good morning. Um, my name is Roxanne Padilla, and I am the Victim Services Manager at the Navajo County Attorney's Office. I manage the Victim Services Department, that, that's the Legal Advocacy Center for Victims of Crime in Navajo County. I also am the Chairman of the Domestic Violence Fatality Review Board and uh, the Director and Victim Compensation Coordinator for our Victim Compensation Program where I can help pay for medical expenses and counseling expenses, um, different t funeral claims and things for victims of crime in Navajo County. I manage a staff of about two and a half right now. Hopefully we're trying to get some more funding and um, increase the amount of services that we can provide and I'm glad to be here to talk to you today about domestic violence. Well, we're happy to have you. Thank you, Roxanne. Mm -hmm. Hi, Abby. Hi, good morning, Donna Faye. Um, <clears throat> Thank you for having me here. My name's um, Abby Joplin. I'm the Native American Community Advocate for the White Mountain Safe House. Um, I work, my program is called the Stand Strong Project, but I've been with the Safe House for six years. Um, we are a 26 bed shelter for women and children, but we do also help men. Um, with my Stand Strong Project, I work closely with our, uh, the White Mountain Apache Tribe as well as the Navajo Nation. I um, do trainings and presentations as well and community outreach um, to let everyone know that you know the safe house is here for victims when they feel that they have nowhere to go and I'm thankful to be here to um, bring awareness because October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Great well it's great to have both of you here today and talking about such an important conversation and to be recognition um, so community members are understanding and also for those who might be suffering from domestic violence have an idea of maybe the services or places that they can go to seek help so we're grateful that you're able to be here today. Um, in some of the research and just kind of you know talking to other people about maybe the myths of domestic violence. Um, there are several of them and one that comes out over and over again is um, why doesn't she or he just leave? And so um, maybe you can talk or talk a little bit about this myth and why um, that isn't so. Sure, a lot of the times you know we hear people say why do they go back? Why don't they just leave? Um, there's multiple reasons, multiple different um, occasions why the the victim doesn't leave the situation you know with the economy you know maybe he or she um, the um, abuser is the the bread maker of the family so you know economy wise economic wise uh, she she doesn't have the means or he doesn't have the means to leave um, the the situation um, as well as um, you know the safety you know I think we were talking about you know the you know with Roxanne being on the fatality review board, the most times that the victim is um, at harm is when they, they're leaving the relationship that, that they're in. Um, you know, as the support network, having somewhere to go, having um, no one to, to run to, to talk to. And that's why, you know, as a survivor myself of domestic violence, I, I like to go do outreaches to let them know, hey, you know, there is a safe house. They may not want to come here, but we'll be providing other resources as well at the end of the show to know there are places that they can go. Um, and safety planning, I feel, is very important when you're in a relationship of um, domestic violence to uh, say, you know what, these are the options I have. Let me start planning on it. You know, maybe putting some funding aside slowly to get uh, to get to a safer place. And uh, you have to understand that there are aspects of emotional abuse that come hand in hand with physical abuse. Domestic violence isn't always <coughs> physical. Um, it usually stems because they have been so emotionally abused for so long that they're allowing this to occur in their lives. They think that they're worthless. They believe the things that this person is telling them. And so a lot of times with that comes a sense of guilt and intimidation and that comes directly from the batter and that's a, a way that he's asserting or she is asserting control over an individual. And isolation, um, another aspect of, um, of domestic violence is generally the batter 
he makes an he or she makes an, a conscious decision decision to try to remove or isolate that victim from people that support that person and um, they need to kind of reconnect with that support system and they need help. It's almost impossible for a victim to get out of a situation like this without a support system. And that's why it's so important that we have resources like the safe house where victims can go to to help with safety planning and can get out safely. Yeah. And a lot of times in society, I think like we always think, why is she going back? Why, are, why does he or she keep going back? But we should look at it from the other opposite end and say, if he or she loves that person, why are they harming them? You know, and that's the way we should look at it. But a lot of the time, it's victim blaming. Mm -hmm. You know, why or why don't why don't they leave the situation? And I think that's one of the <coughs> great opportunities here, is kind of shedding some light on that and supporting victims. Um, that if we're aware of victims in our family or have friendships, that we be a little more gentle and understanding to those circumstances. And certainly by what you've just communicated, that it's a pattern based over a long period of time. Um, that it's not something that just happens one night and um, one day or whatever it might be. It is something that is happening over time and that victim is becoming um, either mentally um, prohibited from being able to think maybe clearly um, that it might be um, the pressure of trying to know what their future is going to look like so there's a lot of pressures and a lot of things that we um, maybe are not too understanding of and certainly taking the time to be understanding of the victim's perspective and we always um, one of the things that the services that you provide and others provide in our community allows um, for victims and also families who might be suffering from those issues because certainly it's not just the victim who is being who's suffering from those issues if there are family members or they have um, it's happening within the family I know that the those things can be issues as well. So we're grateful that you can provide those services. One of the things that you provided me was uh, the power and control will. And I think that you have this up on your computer. So if you can talk a little bit about what that is and what that means. Sure. Um, domestic violence is about power and control, having that power and control over the victim. And a lot of people in our society think that domestic violence is just physical abuse. You know, a hit, a slap, a pinch. But it's more than that, you know, in depth of that. Um, we'll go over the power and control wheel. Roxanne and I will take it a section at a time maybe and kind of give examples. And the first one we want to go over is intimidation. You know, by making the victim feel uh, afraid by using looks, you know, glares. Um, gestures, you know, um, across the room showing a, you know, a fist that he's going to hit her later or smashing things, um, destroying the property. And it even goes as far as possibly abusing the pets even before abusing the victims, you know, uh, displaying weapons, you know, so that's, you know, a form of intimidation uh, for power and control. Um, the next one would be emotional abuse and putting somebody down. And I think that that is, um, emotional abuse can be, I guess, many factors. It could, making, making that person feel some way responsible. Like, I hit you because you made me do this to you. And if you didn't behave this way, then you wouldn't see this reaction from me. And then and that, that re, um, reinvests in that victim's mind that if I start to assert control or assert myself in this relationship, um, then I am making a bad decision or I am not smart enough to do so, I'm not pretty enough, I can't get anything el anybody else other than this. If I get out of this situation, um, I'm not worthy of a better situation. Um, those types of things are involved in emotional abuse. And I think that that's kind of where domestic violence begins. Um, when somebody enters a relationship with somebody who's going to commit domestic violence against that person, that batterer, that perpetrator, they know exactly what they're doing. I mean, I work in the criminal justice system and I work with a lot of domestic violence victims and I see similarities between um, batterers 
that of all of these aspects, I mean, these aspects on this power and control will are dead on. You, you can see the way that they behave in even courtroom settings, the way that they assert themselves against authority. A lot of time, times they don't have any type of um, self-awareness. So, you know, the next one is isolation. And this is a red flag that I see uh, families need to look at when they see their loved ones not being able to go to birthday parties or gatherings, Christmas gatherings, um, because the abuser just wants that person to themselves. Or you see a behavior where they were able to fix their hair or wear makeup, and then all of a sudden they can't because he's uh, controlling everything that um, this person can or cannot do and also limiting um, their involvement you know outside um, maybe even at work you know just going to work just to do work and having to leave at a certain amount of time so isolation I see is a red flag and key um, so if you're a family member and you're used to having time with your your siblings or mm -hmm. someone you know and they stop doing it and they're giving excuses of why they can't attend your, you know, a birthday party or something, you know, definitely talk to that person because, you know, like I said, isolation I see is a, a red flag of a person going into a, a relationship that is involving domestic violence, but they may not see it because they're so in love with that person that they're just seeing it like, oh, he's jealous or she's jealous. And they kind of kind of find it kind of like a way of like flattering a way mm -hmm. of showing love so isolation is is to me a big key so someone looking from the outside in in a sense um, and you recognize some of those traits what would be the best thing to do I would say talk to them you know but also be <clears throat> excuse me talk to them also be a listening ear um, and not be judgmental I see a lot of the time where P victims are, um, they don't want to talk because they're afraid of, especially when it comes from family members, mm -hmm. about how they're going to be perceived, how they're going to be looked at, or is it a form of um, they don't want me to be happy, um, they don't want me to be in a relationship where I'm finally finding love. So just being open-minded and just having that listening ear without judgment. Mm -hmm. And if it's hard to speak to a family member, you know, refer them to someone a service provider that they can talk to and and you know get information about mm -hmm. because um, it's it's these what we're providing to the power and control wheel and giving these this information it's good because a lot of people don't see that this is a form of violence mm -hmm. like even the, even the abuse the physical abuse is just a way to assert control over somebody on average I think the national average is it takes um, one, a victim seven times to leave a relationship before they actually are able to get out of that relationship. So they are making efforts to do so. So if, you're, if you have a family member or a friend that, are, that is going through domestic, a domestic violence situation, it's important to just be there for them when they are, when they are really ready to exit that mm -hmm. relationship because they will need support. Mm -hmm. And even if they don't, just like she said, seven times it's a, it, it can get tiresome sometimes and um, we as service providers also can probably say oh you know we have to help this person again but you know we have to realize mm -hmm. that there are other reasons why they go back to their relationship yeah yeah those <laughs> are great indicators then bringing recognition to community members family members friends um, and identifying, and maybe even identifying our personal selves. Maybe we're in a relationship that we're not identifying that is abusive um, and abusive to ourselves. So it, I think it's a great thing to bring some recognition to that and bring some in looking at those indicators. Yes. So if we go on, I, there are other points to the power and control wheel. Um, minimizing, denying, and or blaming the victim. Um, minimizing is something you see quite often. It's like, well, you know, I didn't really hit you. I just slapped you a little. Um, or I, I don't abuse you because all I did was push you and you happened to fall on the ground. Really making light of the physical abuse that's going on in the relationship. That way the victim second guess, well, really was I abused? And, and that could help, um, keep that victim from reaching out and trying to gather resources and keeping them kind of isolated. Also, there's a sense of embarrassment 
and that can come along with this. A lot of victims don't want to tell people that this is happening to me. And we have to be very aware that that's something that they might be feeling as well. Not just fear, but what are people going to think? How am I allowing this to happen, allowing this situation to happen to me? Um, so the next one is using children. And I see this a lot, especially, you know, with the safe house um, where the abuser will tell the victim, you know, if you, I'm going to take the kids away, or if they have visitations, um, the child being the messenger for the abuser mm -hmm. to the victim. And, you know, a lot of that, um, that and that's why I see um, the victim staying in the relationship is because of the child. But in a sense, they don't know that the child is also learning because, you know, it's a learned behavior. And so, when the victim does go back and the family is involved, you know, they, they want their, to keep their family unit together. So it's very important, I see, to have these red flags um, that were given out today mm -hmm. as well. Sorry, I think that's all I have on using yeah, children. I don't know if you have anything <laughs> else. I was like, okay. Um, and then the next uh, cycle in the power and control will is economic abuse. And um, Abby had talked about that initially when she was intro introducing domestic violence in this segment. Um, but it is something that is very substantial. If you have an individual who doesn't have the means to leave a relationship, if their only other option is to essentially become homeless or not be able to support their children, or even in the future think, I'm never going to make a job, I'm, uh, have a job that can support my family, that's going to make it very difficult for that victim to feel like they can safely leave that relationship, mm -hmm. especially if, if you have somebody um, who is going to be impoverished at that point. And anymore, I mean, for a regular family, a regular normal family relationship, it takes two incomes anymore to, to run that family. And so that victim really needs support. There is, there is things out there that there, you know, people can get um, access um, to food stamps and welfare and shelter services and we have Catholic Charities that provides a great amount of support. The local churches do. So there are ways for that victim to find money. I, I just want to encourage people if they know somebody that money should never be the reason that they stay in that relationship. I think that speaks to a little of the things that Abby brought to our attention in a sense of creating a plan. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at, you know, what does that plan look like and where can I get some of those resources? If it's monetary, if it's housing, if it's, you know, child care, you know, all of those elements, um, certainly it, it becomes where the person almost has to create a new life. And that becomes really challenging. And so when you talk about it in those words, um, you know, it really is, um, you could see why it's so important to bring awareness because we certainly don't want individuals to be living in those circumstances or to feel the weight that there is no way out and that um, there aren't any resources for them. Yes, definitely true. You know, and um, the next one that we're going to go to is um, male privileges. But the thing about this power and control wheel is it keeps saying her you know, so she, her, but men are also victims, you know, and I, I do commend the, the male victims that I have worked with because as, you know, a man, it takes a lot to say, hey, you know, I am the victim and my wife is the abuser or a girlfriend is the abuser. And it, it's coming, men are coming out more saying that they are, and I, I commend them. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to male privileges, you know, it's when the man is defining the roles and saying, you know, I'm the boss or I'm, I'm the one that's working. I'm, you got to do what I say because that's what women do, you know, and you got to be home, take care of the children. You know, when men abuse that and use that often in a relationship, that is a form of power control and it is domestic violence, you know, so um, that's that section. And I guess the last um, section on the power and control will is coercion and threats. Uh, making and or carrying out threats to do something to hurt the other person. I mean, threatening, uh, threatening can be a lot of things. It can be, I'm going to threaten 
um, your job that you do drugs. I'm going to call your boss and tell him that they need to drug test you and you do drugs. That way you lose your job if you continue this behavior or if you don't do what I say, that type of thing to assert control. It can also be, I'm going to kill you. I am going to kill your family. I'm going to kill all of our family and our children and myself. That, those are huge fear, fears that the victim has. Are, those things are going to happen and when they're constantly being told that if you don't behave in this certain way, I'm going to carry out these threats, then it reinforces them to stay in that relationship, which, which is very dangerous. And I think one of the things that we talked about prior to this was um, the, the red flags, I guess, that come up. And also at that point when a abuse or a, a victim decides to leave, that that point becomes the greatest point of um, severity. I think one of those, in, in looking at the indicators and in looking at um, when a victim decides to leave, that at that point there are certainly, that that person needs a lot of support, that that person needs friends reaching out, that they need family members, that they need all of the services that you provide, because um, certainly we don't want to see them in a more severe situation. And so what are some of those things that you were talking about? You were mentioning risk factors. Um, well, I, there's a few things that, I mean, there's different levels of domestic violence and when we are considering risk, the risk of a victim is continually changing based off of the circumstances in their lives. I mean, they could be at severe risk very early on in their relationship and then at a lower level risk later on because it's asserting this, oh, well, I'm going to control you, I'm going to threaten you, I'm going to intimidate you, all of a sudden I'm sorry, that type of thing. But there are national statistics that these cases have been looked at and if these things are occurring in a relationship then that victim as it is at a, a substantially higher likelihood of being a victim of a fatality. Um, some of those aspects include if the batter owns or possesses a firearm, if at any point in the relationship that victim has been strangled. Uh, strangulation, just since I've worked at the county attorney's office within the last six years, used to be a misdemeanor offense and we are now learning um, that there is a substantially greater risk to str strangulation than was ever considered before, and it's now a class four felony offense. But with strangulation, you also don't leave a lot of bruising or marking. You could even smother somebody with a pillow and you would see no you know, bruises or anything on that individual. So it is a tool that some batterers use and they can become so good at it that at the point that they strangle them, they know exactly when to release pressure that that victim comes conscious yet again. So um, the, that also um, sexual abuse, if that victim has been abused sexually by their partner, that they are at a substantially higher risk. Those are a few things to, to kind of keep uh, a lookout for because those victims could become victims of a fatality. I mean, we can never predict if they will be a fatality or not, but mm -hmm. these are some of the things we look for. Well, we're going to wrap up, but I, I want to just speak to the fact that uh, it's an important conversation for us to have. It's uh, certainly a challenging one um, where there's many factors involved. You have family members who are involved. You have a person's livelihood, um, and it could be the livelihood of two individuals and the family members who um, live with that family. Um, and so it, I'm grateful that you had the opportunity to be here to share some of those things and for us to be aware as community members of what that looks like. Um, for the month of October, um, we are recognizing domestic violence and bringing awareness to it. Uh, so here at Navajo County, that we're grateful that um, we can do that with you. I think, what was the date, Abby? Was national? Um, it was October 15th. 15th. October 15th is the National Day of Recognition yes, for and Domestic Violence. Yes, Wear Purple Violence. Day. And Wear Purple so Day. So we want everybody to wear purple in Navajo County, right? Yes. <laughs> we would and like you can see Abby looks purple. great. She okay. does. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for bringing some sparkle to our yes. room today. <laughs> but um, those of you who are in the community, I certainly hope that we provided some information that's useful to you today. And if you have a family member or you're dealing with domestic violence in your home, that um, here are great 
resources and two great women who are, um, to, are there to be able to reach out to and to help in whatever the circumstances may be. And um, we hope that you will join us next month. And um, thank you, ladies. And I will be wearing purple on October 15th. Thank you. Thank you.